Sure. And off, off we go. How are you feeling today? It's a beautiful day. It's the 18th of yeah. May. And, and it's a holiday. So it is. we can sit back. We can sit back and uh, collect Dragon our holiday nuts. pay. Yes. Yeah, that's right. That time and a half. And you have a star in your, uh, your oh, backyard. Oh, yes. There's all kinds of stuff there. Yeah. I'll show you what, the... What, um, what is this? Somebody attacked a telephone pole with wiring. Oh, it's all over the place. When this is all in bloom, it'll be quite something. Let me see if I can get the other room. Um, the other view... Is this the view down into the forest where the lion attacks uh, Dorothy? Yes. Let me see if I can get the other view. I think it's going to be backwards. Oh yeah, no, that's not. That's the wrong view. Anyway, that's the other. That's the mirrored view. Oh, you have a beautiful uh, evergreen up there. Which yes, a, it's a, quite. We have a, a lovely kind of enclosed thing going on here. And a let bird bath. If, and a bird bath that weighs a about Clorox nine hundred pounds oh it's it's not one of those hollow cheap no old no 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 things, no right? this is there and here you go is this the older one or the new one no here's here's oh, the no pump. don't don't hide the bunnies the bunnies oh, and my God. Uh, there's the pump that i spent uh, this is the one that the fight broke out over yesterday because uh, i wasn't properly wait, wait, wait a minute wait a minute wait, you two <laughs> argue yes we do yeah. You're not you're not gonna put the hole there, are you? <laughs> so Well, we had a I I was uh, I was just feeling one of those really bored days. Yeah. I mean, and you called me and mixed you emotion. Called me crying, in the middle of the afternoon. Crying. So I called you. And I thought, you know, if we talk for a few hours, I could feel a lot better. Mm -hmm. And your lovely, lovely spouse took over the phone and she just she just he raged and raged and against your me. Number, pal. That's right. Yeah. yeah. He yeah. thinks you're nothing but a whiny he rammed little Rammed my head into the yeah. wall, figuratively dear, speaking, of dear, course. Dear, could you try to make the subway uh, station a little bigger? <laughs> oh, she's going to kill me now. No, we're having a great time. And she's been very busy and she's meticulous about all these things. Of course, I, I kid her, but uh, it makes for a lovely, lovely spot. And in these, these days, when you're looking out from your... And you have a lovely garden as well. We work pretty hard on it, yeah. yeah. So, but when you look Not out, as... it's, it's nice to look out over something. Anyway, Mitch Melnick is in the green room. I just wanted to... Uh, you and I were sad to hear of the passing of um, Fred Willard this week. The greatest scene still, uh, stealer in television or, or films. And uh, it brought back memories of this show... Fernwood oh. Tonight. Do you remember yep. that? Oh, yeah. Uh, yep. cr created by Norman Lear. It ran for uh, uh, just a few months, 1977. They did oh, 60... Oh, only a few months. Oh, yes. They did 65 it's shows. Hysterically funny. 65 shows in just a few months. And that's, that's uh, Frank Duvall, the, the bald guy, was the musician. Very funny as well. Frank Duvall. Frank Duvall. Now and deceased as well. Uh, Frank died in 1999. Martin Mall in the middle, and uh, and th there's Fred, and they were and they were riffing. They were just improvising half the time, and some of it was howlingly funny. Kenneth Mars was on this show too. Oh my gosh, that's frightening. He played yeah. the uh, he played. Uh, he was the technical uh, Franz director Lincoln in uh, in yep. the producers. And Kenneth Mars, I think, was the uh, was the floor floor director or something in the show. So, <laughs> you, oh yeah. Yeah, that is if you want, scary. If you want to watch something weird, I'm, there may be some lost episodes of Fernwood tonight out there. And, well, Martin uh, Mull was great on, uh, I, I, I think he'd been on Carson a couple of times, but he came on because he plays a guitar and sings as well. As yes, yes. And he was on Carson and he said, you might not know this song. And he starts playing. And he, I, I've been to Europe, you know. And then he starts <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's very, very glib. With a table funny. lamp, a little table yeah. lamp on the next to it. Anyway, <laughs> Mark, yeah. Uh, well, Fred would, was best in his Christopher Guest films, I think. Waiting for Guffman, Best yeah, in Yeah, and again, Go, deadpan, Steel. very, very funny. And the show was produced by Alan Thicke. Canada's own. And I'm, uh, I Sudbury interviewed... Sudbury Boy or Kirkland Lake? Kirkland Lake, Ontario. I interviewed Alan Thicke about 20 years ago. He was in town here shooting a made-for-TV movie, and uh, he was terribly charming, very, very nice, very approachable. 
And we got to talking about Kirkland Lake and uh, he asked me where I was from. And then when he found out I was from Sudbury, we just, we didn't, we didn't speak a word about what he was shooting. We spent half an hour talking about other things and he was absolutely delightful to talk to. And he's well, been Well, Kirkland gone. Lake produced, I think, produced about 9 million hockey players for yep. the NHL. I believe Dave Keon was from Kirkland Lake. Actually, our, our may, guest could probably confirm that because he knows everything about sports. You may be right. But uh, anyway, uh, that brought back memories. And of course, Alan's been gone for four years now already. Uh, sudden, hmm. uh, sudden death uh, while playing hockey in California. And, oh, uh, right. Heart attack. So... Huh. Um, so that's that's what uh, that came came to my little brain here when we heard of uh, Fred's passing. Well, um, a movie I didn't like uh, with uh, uh, Dan isn't that terrible uh, about the uh, uh, broadcaster, the anchorman. I guess it was called Anchorman, and uh, he was the uh, executive producer. Oh, that's right. He, he was in the... Dimwit. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but every scene he was in, it was all his. Yeah. It was stupendous. He was in Modern Family too, the more the more yes. recent uh, sitcom too. So Fred Willard, and he won a day a daytime Emmy on a soap, of all things. Right, he was everywhere. Hard, yeah. hard working guy. Anyway, so uh, R.I.P. Fred Willard. Let's bring in Mitchell. Let's see if he's been able to connect. I think he was going to use his phone to connect with us this morning. Okay. Oh, there's oh, there's, there's a the, ding dong. There he Hi, is. Mitch. Hey. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. How are you surviving? I can't find my fucking glasses. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess we're off and running then, Mitch. That's great, sweetheart. <laughs> you ever? Do you have a second pair of glasses that you keep to put oh, on? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Glasses? My wife yeah, has yeah. got 700 of these hanging around the house. Oh, yeah. I, get, I get another yeah, I wear my too. wife's glasses. Yeah. <laughs> God, Mitch, is can't it, read have, we, have we all reached this age? Damn it. We have, haven't we? Oh, yeah. Yeah, do you have bifocals now, Mitch, or do you just... You no, can't... no, no, I have, uh, what do you call them, when, when it, it, they turn into sunglasses when I'm outside because... Oh, yes, yeah. You know, they get dark, yep. right. but uh, I used to wear lenses. I stopped wearing lenses a long time ago. I can read uh, without glasses. Well, you see, the problem I used to have, and you know, sitting in the studio, uh, I couldn't read the script, but then when I looked up, I couldn't see where my uh, my director in the studio was. So I, I just I just yes, decided... Yes, sometimes the microphone was back here, that. too, right? Remember that morning when, they, when the technician told you to turn the fuck around? <laughs> where are you? Yeah. Uh, I'm out in the west end of Montreal. He's up in St. Eustache, and this you're in a, the city. This is I'm in the point, screen. yeah. This is a blue screen. How are you, how are you surviving, Mitchell? How are you doing in these in these weird days? Uh, well, until a week ago, I was working, so it it hasn't you know it's been uh, it's been difficult like for everybody. But uh, we've been busy. I've been busy, and uh, I'm in the middle of uh, of two weeks off right now. Uh, but I found things to do. You know, the weather is turning for me. I really appreciate that because uh, I'm on my bike a lot. Uh, and I'm just getting caught up on stuff. You know, everybody's got a to-do list. That's probably in my case, you know, I don't know if it's typical or not, but, um, when I remember to look at the to-do list, I realize I have a lot to do <laughs> and, uh, it, it just grows every month. So I'm oh, yeah. slowly crossing everything off that list. Right. But Mitch, you know, you know, people who make lists, it's, it's a sign of mental illness. <laughs> okay. Guilty. <laughs> Because I, I don't go near them, but I'm 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 a sicko too. So it's 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 two different aspects of the same thing. So doing sports radio in in this day and age has been a challenge, has it? Yeah, sure. But you know, my my the show that I do is kind of uh, uh, incorporates a lot of other elements other than sports. So. Um, so I'm, I'm not, it's not as challenging. And especially after they cut all our shows uh, an hour. Uh, so I'm three to six instead of three to seven. Okay. Uh, with that in mind, uh, it's, it's, there's a lot of storytelling right now, which is basically a big part of the art of radio and communicating is telling stories. So it gives us, it gives everybody a chance uh, for us. It's our, our guests are, our regular insiders, they're full of stories, you know, Pierre Maguire and uh, Aaron Ward and Ray Ferraro, guys like that. Uh, uh, they're just great storytellers. So it, it really, it, you know, it's, it's, I prefer 
to be talking about some live events, but what are you going to do about it? You, what's the sense of getting uh, worked up about it? We just, we just deal with it the best we can. We try to keep it light. Uh, I don't think people are tuning into us to hear us complaining about um, anything like people not wearing masks and that kind of stuff. They get enough of that elsewhere. So we've tried to keep it light, a lot of comedy, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of music. You know, I play a lot of music on my show, uh, talk to musicians. So it's, it's been, uh, it's been challenging, but really not, not that difficult. I listened to one of the segments, uh, you were off that day, but they had Ray Ferraro on. And I, I saw the, the headline, it said, the ugliest jerseys in the NHL. And I thought, oh God, how are these poor bastards gonna talk about this for fi-? And it turned out to be just great. It was wonderful. There are a lot of hideous uniforms, in it, including, the, including the centennial ones the Canadians put on in 2009. Remember the barbershop stripe jobs? Sure. I, uh, absolutely. It's hard. That's hard to forget. Oh. I mean, that, that was like a, an acid flashback. Yeah. Hideous. Uh, in music, uh, as you say, it is a, an important part of, of the show. I gather it was uh, sad news that uh, of the passing of John Prine. Yeah, that one hit me really hard, Dave. Um, you know, I'm part of Billy Bob Productions and, and a great, great moment in, in Montreal music was we were the only people to ever ask John Prine to play in Montreal. Uh, and uh, it, that was up, that was in 2001. It was in August of 2001 before everything changed. And uh, Lloyd Fishler is a criminal lawyer. He started Billy Bob Productions. And we had talked a lot about artists that we were bringing a lot of singer songwriters playing in small clubs, but we wanted we were wondering why John Prine had never played here. He was such a big fan. We saw him at the Landmine Benefit concerts in Ottawa and Burlington. It pissed us off that we had to see people like Prine and Emmy Lou Harris uh, outside of our city. And we talked to a couple of people in the business that I respected, and they just didn't think an English singer-songwriter could sell tickets. Um, and we just didn't believe them. We, we thought otherwise. And we got, a help. We got a lot of help from... Uh, Prime's manager, Al Bonetta, who, who passed away a few years ago from cancer. Uh, much like what you've seen recently, if you've been following Fiona Prine on social media, that John, one of the last great things that John Prine did, he was finally asked to play in France. And, and, and it meant so much to him. And it was a sellout. That was the only time he was ever invited to play in France. Because we asked him and we, we, uh, we were persistent, he agreed to cut his normal fee to play for us and he agreed to play in a, in a club like the spectrum because he had already graduated to theaters as long as we treated him to a genuine french weekend experience in montreal it really <laughs> meant a lot to him we took him to le mas des Olivier, uh, and uh with with his band his uh his road manager and his manager albanetta and it was myself lloyd fishler and gary silverman the three of us were in billy bob at the time and uh, it was just a tremendous, tremendous night. And um, we, the, the stories and uh, uh, the warmth that he projected, he had, uh, you know, he had, had that cancer that took away half of his neck, right? And uh, we, got the, we got the full skinny on so many. That Bonetta was like a music encyclopedia. And, uh, and then we had uh, the sound check the next day. And uh, he had asked when we left the restaurant if there was anything specific that I wanted to hear. And, and uh, I was playing the song, uh, I've Been a Bad Boy, a lot on, on my CIQC show at the time. And I walked into Soundcheck and I went into the balcony. I wanted to hear how it sounded up in the balcony at the Spectrum. And I was the only person in there. And he started to play Bad Boy and he played the song for me. Uh, we went to the, we got to the concert. We sold out the Spectrum. They had scalpers in the front. It was raucous. A lot of uh, a lot of Ottawa Valley people. Every musician that didn't gig that night in Montreal was there. Actors were there. It was just a Tom Russell Open. It was a great, great night. Better than any of us could have imagined. And I saw Brian afterwards backstage, and he was he was eating he was eating a pizza and spaghetti, and, and who knows what else was there. He was just diving in. And uh, he looked at me. And he saw me. He said, "Hey, I, I'm sorry. I don't play that song anymore, but I played it for you at Soundcheck." And it was like, you know, that wow, was, what a mensch. Wow. Yeah. What a mensch. yeah. So that was, that was tough. The irony, of course, of dying with, with, the, with the precondition he had, and he died of COVID-19. Yeah, he had the spot uh, on his log, right? So many wonderful, ironic, wry things to say about the weird situation we're in. Yeah, this is a guy who survived cancer twice. He had, he had, he had a spot on his lung not that long ago. 
and he had pneumonia. So, you know, I, I kind of, when I heard that he was hooked up to a ventilator with his, you know, challenged immune system and his recent unhealthy past, I, I wasn't confident at all. And then his wife uh, tweeted something that he was doing okay. Or, but then she had to immediately follow up by saying, I, he's not cured. Uh, and, and then when it went into the second week, uh, I didn't feel good about it. So it wasn't shocking to hear it pass, but he was, you know, the, the tree of forgiveness, his last album, you know, when I get to heaven, he, he knew he was definitely knew he was on the back nine. Wow. I, Yvonne, you go no, ahead. I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking of many thoughts. Please continue, David. Well, I, I, I guess getting into the, into the sports realm, uh, th back into the sports realm, uh, Mitch, uh, first of all, the CFL asking for $150 million. Uh, there was a liberal MP from Hamilton who said that the commissioner could have asked for it in a much better fashion, sort of a, as a, you know, a, a national treasure where he just pleaded poor. I guess the, the, the pro and con of this is, if they ask for the dough, they're going to have to show how bad the finances of the CFL are, especially in Montreal, Toronto, and uh, and Vancouver. Well, we know how bad it is in Montreal, but they just got a new owner, right? And uh, yeah. so it's it's hard. We, so, but yeah, the league has to open up. If you can't claim these losses and and the desperate need to get help from the government without showing just how bad it is, um, and look, I don't doubt that uh, there are serious issues here, and the government has acted before to help the Canadian football league. You guys remember uh, the old world league when they, uh, they the Toronto Northmen, uh, they were forced to fold because they were bringing three guys from the Miami dolphins up here. And uh, Mark Lalonde was the minister at the time. And he said, no, this, if, if, if a successful Toronto franchise takes off, it's going to kill the Canadian football league. Uh, that was 74, 73 around there. So uh, I don't know how, how, how much of a, uh, part of the fiber of the country is the Canadian Football League. That's so, you know, I, I don't mind some of my tax dollars going to help the Canadian Football League, but I don't know. Am I in the minority? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, this is what this liberal MP from Hamilton who used to play CFL football said that uh, Ambrosi should have conveyed that. What a natural national treasure it is. The other thing is about, is about hockey, uh, of course, and the commissioner, Gary Bettman said, oh, not having a season isn't even on my list of possibilities, which I thought was, wait a minute, it's got to be on your list of possibilities. I mean, the way we're going, uh, do you see us starting to play, continue the season, starting to play another season in August or September? I, I don't see Well, that. they're doing it. They're, they're doing yeah. it. I, you know, I'm, I'm hearing that it's pretty close. And uh, it, again, it's, I can't sitting, sitting, I've been actually since March, I've been doing my show from home. Uh, but I can't, I haven't been able to project ahead to look, to th even think what it would look like in empty arenas, uh, the National Hockey League playoffs starting and competing for the cup. I haven't allowed myself to even go there. I understand you got a plan for it, but I was not when this started thinking that the NHL was going to resume. But the longer we went, uh, the more obvious it was that they were pushing for. There's a lot of television money at stake. There's there's a uh, there's some momentum they have in some markets. Vegas is going to be a hub because they've got the, the, the all the empty hotels near where the arena is, where they could put everybody in. Uh, and again, it's 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 not about what you and I think. Obviously, I, I'd rather talk about live sports than no sports at all, but. In terms of the safety factor, I can understand the reticence by the athletes, but if by and large the Players Association signs off on this because they've been convinced that every precaution is being taken, uh, that everything is being sanitized to the nth degree, if it's okay with them and it's okay with the owners, then then go ahead. It's your sport. You know, we'll talk about it. We'll 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 support it. I I you know I. I don't know how I'd feel personally if I was a National Hockey League player about. Uh, uh, yeah, with a young family. Right. Yeah, and, and you, no checking. Uh, I'm not a I'm not a, a person who likes fighting in the N a NHL anyway. But no fighting. Uh, and, no spitting. And I can't lick people. So no, no spitting. Spit <laughs> no checking. Well, I mean social distancing. Oh. Yeah, exactly. There. That's yeah. No, that's not feasible. <laughs> that's definitely not feasible. Okay. Oh my. Uh, Mitchell, listen, I'm going to go back a little bit further here. When I think of stalwart broadcasters in, in this city, I think of you. Are you still in love with radio, my friend? 
whether you're doing it from home or from a studio? Yeah, it's been it's been tough doing it from home because uh, I, I rely so much on, uh, um, you know, ad libs and cueing and in the moment and eye contact and, and all of that. And plus, I haven't been able to hear myself on my headset, which is really difficult. Right. But I survived. I am going back on the 25th. Next Monday, I'll be back in studio. That's okay. Okay. But uh, yeah, I've I to, I grew up. Uh, you know, it's a cliche, but I'm one of those people that grew up literally with my radio under my pillow at night, bringing in all the 50,000 watt super American stations. Most of the time, listening to hockey games or baseball games or even some basketball games. But also, there were some music stations that I listened to. Buff. There, I remember one at the the very end of the dial on the right, I don't remember the radio station, but it was Buffalo and they played music. The only other person on AM radio playing music at that time was Dave Patrick. And oh I used my to gosh, Dave yeah. Patrick in the evening on CFCF radio. That's where I first heard Dylan's Desire album. Dave Patrick was playing Isis and Black Diamond Bay on CFCF radio between 7 and 10 p.m. <laughs> and then he followed up with, and then he, I heard Dire Straits, Sultan of Swing. I heard the same, that's the first time I heard it was with Dave Patrick. To me, he was always him and Dina Gopian and these guys. I I revered them. Right? I, any chance I had to, Jimmy Tapp was another old school oh, guy gosh, that yeah. did oh, really, goodness. really really well. When I was starting <clears throat> radio, and I was fortunate. Patrick was unique. I mean, he was a true eccentric. Yeah, yeah, and and he reminded me so much of of being someone in that San Francisco scene when the whole FM radio underground started in sixty six, sixty seven, around here. I always thought he was like our Tom Donahue. Uh, Dave Patrick, and I don't know. He used to he used to he used to read book reports in the morning. Guy would read a book every night so he could talk about it the next day. I was just—he's one of those people who inspired me to, to to keep going higher and higher and higher. Keep pushing. Do whatever you want. There's always somebody out there who can relate to what you're talking about, whether whether it's a strict format or not. The people I work for—I've been very lucky. They gave up. They've all tried to kind of squeeze me into a format, but. Uh, I'd walk away. If, if I ever had to do that, I would have walked away. I have walked away, actually. One thing I miss, miss about being together in live events, and you remember this one well because it only happened a few months ago. You had Ken Dryden and Scotty Bowman at a theater at Loyola for the book about Bowman and a full house. And that's when you realize you've got to have people in the room because the excitement about the storyteller, the great storyteller Dryden, and the great storyteller Scotty Bowman made for a wonderful evening. It looked as if you were really having fun. This was to promote uh, the book Dryden wrote about, uh, about Scott Bowman. Yeah, Scotty's, basically, uh, it's Scotty's story, uh, growing up not far from where I am in Verdun and working at the Sherwin-Williams plant up the street in the point here. Uh, but also, it's almost like two books in one, but also as a judge with a very unique perspective of uh, judging the greatest hockey teams of all time in NHL history. And at the end, there's kind of this round robin tournament and Ken relies on Scotty going through all their strengths and weaknesses. And the Canadians have won five cups in a row. I don't want to be a spoiler here. You got to read the book. It's a fascinating story. But at the end, he knocks out the Canadians team that won five in a row almost immediately. Uh, but it's just, it's, uh, it's, like, it's like listening to, to Dryden and Bowman uh, telling stories about some of the greatest teams in the history of hockey. And uh, you know how well Ken writes. His detail is so vivid. And uh, then I was asked to host that event at, uh, at Loyola. And that, that, that was just a, that was a huge perk. And uh, uh, I don't I know couldn't what Ken believe, Dryden. I couldn't believe next. Bowman's, I couldn't believe Bowman. He's 86. And I, I don't mean to compliment him to the he's point. He's older than that, Dave. What's that? He's older than that. He's 87? I think he's 88. Oh, my God. Well, anyway, his memory is prodigious. I mean, and not just for boring details. He told stories well, too, about certain players, certain... It was amazing. Yeah, his, his brain, he's like the rain man of hockey. There's some people yeah. like that yeah. where you just press a button and a moment comes out. Uh, it, it's, I've, I've been fortunate enough. Pierre Maguire's like that. Uh, the former Expos uh, general manager, Dan Duquette, was like that. You just you kind of see their eyes go somewhere when you mention a player's name. Could be from any era. And it's like it's on instant recall. It's uh, yeah, remarkable. It's great. great stories. A wonder, it was a wonderful evening. And I, I also remember in the book, I don't want to be a spoiler, but early on in the book, 
Dryden talks about Bowman. He said, you know, I didn't like him all that much because Bowman would tell you exactly what he thought of what you were doing. And he told, he told Dryden off a few times. Yeah. He told Dryden, he's basically full of himself yeah. and here he did. <laughs> and, it's, and here's what you should be doing uh, to, to become a better teammate. Yeah. All right, Mitch. One last question. Is Dave Keon from Kirkland Lake, Ontario? Dave Keon is from uh, Ruan Naranda, is he not? Ruan, that's right. Okay. Oh, okay. Which is just there across. Yeah. Okay. We that's were right. getting our towns mixed up earlier. We we're talking about uh, Alan Thick and Kirkland Lake and a bunch of other things. Okay. Mitch, thank yeah. you, buddy. Hey, good to see you guys. Good I, you to know, see you. Good too. to see you. I appreciate you asking me. And uh, uh, Ivan, you still watch Crime Story? Absolutely. And uh, as soon as I saw your lovely face come up on Facebook about two weeks ago, I said, damn it, we got to get Mitch on because you are one of my idol is a big is a big word. But when it comes to the stalwart people on radio in this city, man, you are up there. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Have fun. You, yes, Stay we're well. talking. Yes, we're talking to you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers. Mitch Melnick, ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only guy's been doing it a long time he has he and started we're talking about getting in there every day and uh and as he well. as he says he gets in there he does music he does cooking he does sports he does a little bit more sports and it goes back and forth and um a renaissance man and uh, you know it is it is difficult when it's an all sports station what we've got is german soccer South Korean baseball, yeah. no fans in the stands, and Rory McIlroy, good for him, uh, had a, a golf tournament, a skins game, uh, with nobody watching uh, to raise money, for, good for him. But it's bizarre, and, and uh, Mitch alluded to it, uh, sitting in an NHL arena, I know you've never been much I'm not a sports a sport, fan. much of a sports fan, you but played I hockey, listen though. to a good Half broadcaster the- talk about anything. Uh, and that, yeah. that applies yeah. to you, too. I mean, you're, I know you're a big sports fan. You and I get along anyway. So I'm not. But the, a person who does his or her job well on the air, whatever they're talking about, I will be more than pleased to listen to. And Mitch yeah. is one of those people. So. Well, I'm glad he brought up Dave Kepatrick because Dave was a true original. Very, very. He, he lived out in Beaconsfield but wore a dashiki. He frightened the whole day. Na- <laughs> Dave was a mountain of a man. He was about 6'6 six, six and 300 pounds. I never met him. No. Huge man. Ma- mm? Just before my time here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, one of the great things he also did when he was at AD, uh, someone you'll know, uh, Tom Armour, yep. would have finished the news. Dave would be doing the late show, and Paul Reed would have finished his evening. And the best part of it was the three of them just talking off the cuff for up to, they, they forgot about the clock and they just talked practically up to midnight some nights. Great storyteller. That's radio. That's radio. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, we are done for today. Tomorrow is, a, it, there's an opening in our calendar for tomorrow. I've contacted a couple of people. We'll see what happens and if we can uh, book yeah, somebody. If in not, there. we'll, uh, if what's, not, who's Wednesday? Uh, Wednesday is Linda Hammerschmidt. Uh, oh yeah, she told me she's quite a pistol. She's uh, quite outspoken, so I don't think we're going to have to uh, prod her into talking about too many things. I haven't okay. spoken to Linda in years. She'll probably tell you the story about the time she made me blush at CJ. <laughs> I don't remember exactly what happened there. Oh really? It uh, takes a lot to make me blush. So if Linda did it, uh, must I'd like to see something. that again. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, if you don't have anybody tomorrow. Uh, either shoot the breeze I contacted or someone or whatever. Well, someone, uh, 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 a colleague of ours from way back who now live, who's been living in Toronto for many years, contacted me this morning. So I'm going to see, get back to her and see if she's available. If not, uh, you and okay. I will coast through and, and move on with other things. Sure. Enjoy the day. It's okay. going to be beautiful. You look like you're in a fine mood and you're salmon polo. So, yep. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm, I'm in the backyard. Uh, yeah. 10 doing minutes what? from now. <laughs> doing what? You, you missed a weed on the left side. Yeah. Is that what you're going to do? <laughs> <sitting> there, <laughs> and my wife says, you get out of the bed, you sort of get dressed, you go down the stairs to the backyard, and then you lie that's on, it, that's on a it. hammock. Yeah. With a large bed. can of Miller Lite. <laughs> <laughs> and a straw. Yeah. Okay, a uh, Demain. We'll see what Demain brings. Easy. All right.